Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Nucleus Investment Insights. Today's episode is called Elboflation, the Energy Edition. Australia is one of the largest energy producers in the world, but we also have some of the highest energy prices. Energy prices are falling in other parts of the world, but they are remaining high here. Is this a function of the government, the energy cartel, or are there also other factors at play? Join us today as we delve into this paradox. Just a quick reminder, this podcast is general advice only and is not intended to be specific to your personal situation. If you do want to discuss your personal financial situation and how to improve that, you can book a call with me or one of the advice team at nucleuswealth.com forward slash contact. Today, as always, we have Nucleus Wealth's co-founder and chief investment officer, Damien Klassen. Welcome back. Hey, Sam. Hey, Demo. My name's Sam Kerr. I'm the head of advice at Nucleus Wealth. Just a reminder, the themes discussed in this podcast are a reflection of our thinking and all our active portfolios. You can find out more about our offering in the description notes below. The show is recorded live every Thursday at 12.30 Australian Eastern Standard Time. So jump onto the Nucleus Wealth YouTube channel and ask any questions that come to mind, and we'll do our best to answer them during the show. The podcast is also available on all major podcast platforms, so feel free to have a listen there if you prefer as well. So those, those are the formalities. Damo, over to you to get the ball rolling. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Uh, so I wanted to have a run through the uh, so, some of the changes that we've seen in, in terms of energy prices. So, so we ran about a couple of months ago a, a podcast looking at the oil price increases that we've seen. And positing the question, you know, is that going to lead to uh, cost pro- cost push inflation, and do we have to you know do we have to cons- uh, be concerned about secondary effects? And we sort of, given the the rest of the macro environment, we came to the conclusion no, it probably wasn't a major issue in terms of second order effects, and that that it was probably going to be more restrictive in terms of uh, pulling back on the economy rather than uh, pushing the, the economy forward. Now the question is effectively the opposite: is is um, you know is the pendulum swinging the other way now? Are we seeing low energy prices, and and is that going to sort of push things um, further down? So I just wanted to run through that that compare and contrast about what we spoke about a couple of months ago, and then uh, what we're talking about now, and, and what the, the big changes, and, and and I guess why these changes have come about, and and what that might actually mean for for uh, investment portfolios and inflation sort of more more broadly. So. Um, yeah, so so we might jump sort of straight into that, and you know, we we spoke about the geopolitics last time about this this idea that uh, we've got this you know problems in the Middle East, and will Iran become involved? Uh, will the US sort of stop looking the other way on on Iranian sanctions? What's happening in the Russia and Ukraine and, and Russian uh, oil in particular, and 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 gas, and then China about how much sway China had over the over the events and i think our large conclusion was was basically that look it seemed relatively well contained it seemed that the uh what would what we'd see is that that iran was in the position of, of it effectively done achieved what it wanted to do which was to sort of blow up the 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 discussions between saudi arabia and 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 israel and so it, it would be it wouldn't be wise to 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 to, to keep going with it, and then, and I, I think we're largely in that same place again. They might still decide to to escalate, and you might still run into to issues, but for for Iran to be to have effectively achieved achieved its goals without you know uh, risking any of its own um, uh, any of its own troops seemed to be a, a a bit of a win for them that they probably should just take and and, and move on. And what that's meant is we've seen this real crash in in uh, energy prices. So I've got the uh, the coal price up. I'll start with that. Now that's obviously not the probably should have started with oil, but it's it's a similar type of uh, similar type of chart. So I've seen that that coal price in the last two months really come down from uh, the sort of you know two hundred plus to to the sort of one fifty ish level, and and lower a few days ago, but sort of uh, bounced back a little bit. We've seen that same similar type of trend now in the US. Uh, oh, sorry, actually this is the LNG prices. So we're looking at 
at Asian LNG prices, and they've sort of come down from from eighteen dollars to to eleven dollars. So again, you know, not quite halving, but you know, down 40 percent in terms of the in terms of prices from from when the uh, when we first saw that that Middle East conflict break out, and so so and below the sort of the lows we we had just prior to the the conflict, I think, which is a, a pretty similar trend, and so. And so this is on the energy side. So yes, yeah, so, so I should have prefaced this by saying, so if I'm talking about energy, our big worry last year was that the, the is it, Europe is going to run out of gas with, with losing the access to gas from, uh, from Russia. In response, they did a whole bunch of different changes and, and, the, the, and they had a very mild winter. And so they're sort of saved in a way by, by that mild winter. But... As a second part, they've, they've rolled through a lot of changes throughout the economy. They've got a lot more uh, liquefied nat natural gas coming now in over by tanker, and so there's still danger this uh, this winter if it turns uh, significantly worse, so significantly colder. You could see that these run down, but by and large, if it's a anything like a um, just an average winter, then uh, they should be fine. And I've got a chart just sort of showing the where the various levels were in terms of uh, the gas reserves that they had and so that goes through this cycle where they build up big gas reserves and then they come into into winter and, and run down those gas reserves now it's a little hard to see on this this chart but the the red line is 2021 uh with there's some dotted lines showing the five-year range the the top and the bottom for the the prior five years and then we, we can see the 2022 numbers in there as well, and so this year, the uh, this year what we've seen is that the 2023 is basically above, you know, a reasonable part above, sort of 10, 15 percent above the levels they've they've had uh, before, or they they had last year, I suppose, and, and even at the above the highs they had over the the, the prior five years. So so lots of storage. Uh, we've got a lot more LNG coming through. It, it's they've had a couple of cold um, weeks in, in the in the in the recent parts depending on where you look, but by and large the the forecasts are for a relatively mild winter again, and so that sort of seems to say that there's not a lot on on that gas side, and what that means for Europe is that uh, gas is that energy prices are going to be down significantly on on prior years, and so uh, this flow through in terms of lower inflation. Uh, allowing the central banks to do to, to to maybe not go as hard and to to factor in some some uh a bit of relief for for consumers and, and government spending so, so that's that the uh the u.s gas prices have come down as well so they sort of u.s gas prices are, are significantly lower than than the rest of the world so so the u.s and this was because the u.s gas used to be sort of trapped in the in that they couldn't export it and it's a U.S. gas is a bit of a byproduct for a lot of the shale oil. So whereas in Europe, the the, the gas that they're getting in Europe is gas that's been produced elsewhere for the for the purposes of, of energy. A lot of the uh, a lot of the gas within the U.S. is actually a little bit different in that it's from the shale oil people who are looking for oil and, and the gas is a byproduct, and so they're just happy to get rid of it at whatever price. And they actually used to flare it. So they used to literally burn the gas because they, they, was, they were busy pulling the oil out and that was the valuable part. And the gas was like, oh, well, we've got nothing to do with it, so we'll just flare it off. Restrictions have now come on for a lot of those and, and, and broader gas networks. And so what we've done, what's ended up happening now is that, that uh, you know, the gas... Prices are still kept quite low in 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 the US, but they're they're now exporting that to Europe, and they're uh, they're looking to basically double the amount of exports over the next uh, couple of years. And so, yeah, very low gas prices compared to the rest of the world, like a, a fifth or, or 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 lower of the rest of the level. So so eighty percent lower than than what you see in 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 the rest of the world. But that that gap should narrow as um as, as more US production comes on. So so yeah, so so looking so far. The gas and the uh, the gas and coal we're looking at prices down significantly. Uh, we might go then to you, Sam, for a quick message, and we'll jump onto oil after that. We'll be back with the investment insights very shortly. Nucleus Wealth is an active and passive investment manager. 
If you like what you're hearing and want some help with the investing, we can do it for you via our active portfolios. Our tactical and core portfolios use the insights shared in this podcast to construct and manage your investment. We blend tactical portfolios to offer our combinations of international shares, Australian shares, government bonds, and cash. We vary the asset allocation with the goal of protecting your capital in times of market uncertainty. We also have active international and Australian share portfolios. These are chosen using our quality and value investment philosophy. You can find out more at NucleusWealth.com. Now back to the show. Yes, so um, I yeah, so as we're talking about oil, so the oil price as well has come that back from sort of ninety-ish dollars. Well, depending upon which one you're looking, but let's say we're talking about U.S. oil, come back from from ninety-ish dollars to seventy-ish dollars, and it that's been this other sort of real driver of. We were talking about it before, uh, even last time we were running. I was saying that the fact that the oil price hadn't run up significantly higher was actually a little bit of a sign that there's there was potentially some some more weakness in the uh, U.S. economy than what we thought. And, and 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 in the global economy than what we thought and i think that's where the point is is that what we're trying to uh what we were sort of hinting at before was that there was this th these signs coming out that that maybe uh the demand for oil and, and other products wasn't as 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 significant as what it, what it looked like it probably should have been was that that might be a sign the the, the economy is weaker than, than what we expected and, and that's basically the, the way it's uh the way we've seen it, it go and so Oil's this real um, input cost into a whole bunch of other things. So anything that needs transport, uh, there's, a, there's a, it goes into construction, it goes into uh, mining, it goes into uh, plastics, polyester. So anything that's using any of these, oil's this input cost into it, and and that can really uh, drive the cost higher. So so what part of the reason for the thought about that, and part of the reason why we're looking at it um, was that we wanted to sort of isolate could we could the higher oil prices we see end up being into this cost push inflation and so now the question needs to come the other way is this the fact that oil prices are falling and energy prices are falling um is that uh is that going to mean that the oil is going to be it yeah, is it going to mean that that we're seeing inflation go go the opposite way and we've sort of titled this this the, the whole thing the alboflation because uh that isn't necessarily the case as much in australia so we are seeing the oil prices come down obviously but we're not seeing the same amount of energy uh price decrease that that we've seen in in other countries and i've got a slide up just showing the uh the gas prices within australia now there's this gas price cap of uh twelve dollars that had been agreed uh and the thing with the uh the thing with the, the thing with the gas price cap is this is sort of this part about we had high prices we had uh, as the uh as the war started in in between ukraine and russia these gas prices went crazy australia is this massive exporter um, for anyone who hasn't sort of listened into some of those prior episodes, effectively the, the short version is Australia is a massive gas exporter. Every other country um, has put on either restrictions or gas reservation or you know tax whatever it is in it so that the actual so that if you're a gas producer and gas prices go sky high, your local companies don't suffer. Now in Australia, we've basically got two different markets: the West Coast, which did exactly that, the, the textbook version of this is what you do when you when you when you're a big oil produ producer or gas producer, is you put on the the uh, the reservation or things like it, so that local companies don't have, face higher prices. The East Coast was convinced that no, no, that's not not necessary. We've got so much gas, it'll never be an issue. We'll never have to worry about prices. And lo and behold, we did we did, <laughs> and so um, and, and the. The Labor government has got this real problem in terms of it was it sort of got kicked out of office last time because it sort of ran a a uh, campaign against uh, against the mining companies and, and trying to put on mining royalty taxes and they lost uh, government they lost uh, prime ministers over it and they had this real fear despite the fact that you know in the, in the mining case 
a lot of them were Australian companies, whereas uh, in, in this case, they're almost all exclusively international companies. And so, so yeah, so we're left in this point where the gas price actually hasn't changed that much. And, and it's, it's because we've got this cap of $12, despite the fact we've seen uh, gas prices in, in Asia come down sort of 30 40%, we haven't seen the same effect uh, in, in Australia as much. And so we're not actually seeing quite the same push through. Now, now we are seeing lower, we are seeing lower energy prices. Having said that, in recent weeks, I've got, a, I've got another chart showing the, the, the national energy market uh, weighted average price. And it's got this, the, the day-to-day ones you can see, and then the, uh, then the thick line is, is the average line. So that's definitely coming down. From, from what it was but it is still there's still some of the recent lines are certainly starting to point up and and, and we're seeing some prices well above that and also it's not coming down anywhere near what we're seeing overseas so i think that it will you know we will see some easing in australia it's it's not going to be as bad as it was but the other thing is uh we're, we're not we're not seeing it to the same extent that that, that what countries are seeing overseas because we're effectively uh allowing the uh, allowing a cartel uh, to to uh, dictate prices in Australia. So, so yes. Yeah, so, you know, the other inflation is a little bit tongue in cheek in that we will see some easing. We're just not going to see the same type of easing we saw we saw elsewhere. Um, and Mike, we'll go to you, Sam, and then we'll talk about what that means for investments and, and supply. We'll be back again shortly. If you like what you're hearing but want a low-cost passive option, Nucleus Wealth is the first to offer passive direct indexing in Australia. The first generation of passive investing was index funds. The next gen was ETFs. Now direct indexing is here with significantly more customization and control. The benefit of direct indexing is you can add or subtract investment themes, and we have almost 100 different options to choose from. For example, you could buy an international share direct index portfolio that excludes fossil fuels and arms manufacturers and has a tilt towards cybersecurity and cloud computing. Alternatively, you could buy a portfolio with no screens and an extra exposure to nuclear power and defense contractors. You can find out more at NucleusWealth.com. Now back to the show. Just one more quick thing. We just want to ask you for a simple favor. We want to spread the message about transparency, innovation, and integrity in investing. At Nucleus Wealth, we live and breathe these values. We would love it if you can help us spread that message, and subscribing to our channel will help us do that. We would be most grateful if you can hit the like and subscribe button now. So, Damo, before we move further, um, I've got a question. I mean, uh, we've got this sort of $12 price cap. Uh, what I'm curious to understand is, are these or are these energy companies just sort of, you know, hovering around this maximum price that they can sort of get away with and, and not bringing it down in line with the rest of the world? Do you, do you think that's at play? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that I think if you if you speak to the oil guy, if you spoke to these companies, they would have lots of good reasons as to why the prices need to be need to be higher. And, and you know, it's a global market and all this stuff like that. But I think uh, the net effect is we, we have a cartel. There's, we have a small number of suppliers. Uh, they can access uh, higher prices internationally. They're buying up as much as they can locally in order to to keep the the, the local gas and the local uh, away from pushing prices down locally. And so I think if you just did a quick East Coast gas comparison versus West Coast gas comparison, and, and, and in the West where they have to reserve prices of been low and stayed low and on the east where they they don't have these reservations i think it's it's a game about how how loudly people squeal and you know i think we're given we've been in an environment with high prices and we've been in an environment with uh with lots of inflation i think uh the the customers have largely they've done a lot of squealing but they've largely um got used to the 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 higher prices or gone out of business and and so i think there's uh you know it's a it's a little bit of a familiar familiar familiarity is sort of um bred out the problem and that and that these guys i guess these local uh users and, and particularly to say uh households they're not looking at and saying just a minute you know gas shouldn't be the same price in australia as what it is in 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 
in Asia because it's our gas. You know, it's, we're producing it here. We've got to freeze it, send it all the way over there, and we're selling it for the same price as the gas here that's coming out of the ground and and going a few hundred yards or a few you know a few hundred kilometers up the road. So there's no reason why you know that same gas should be selling for the same price as, as what it is when you've got to you know literally send it hundreds of kilometers up to Queensland, freeze it, stick it on a ship, send the ship overseas over to the country, you know, drop then unfreeze it to, to bring it back out again. So yeah, I think there is a uh there'll, there'll, there'll be lots of protestations from from the gas companies themselves about you know the reasons why, but I think uh the net effect is they'll they'll charge whatever they can. Mm. And, and, I mean and 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 well in well in well knowing that the the governments uh, in Australia are, are, are not really going to. We talk about having these triggers, and they talk about having these all these issues and and things they're going to do. But the reality is, they they yeah they, they know they're not going to. Yeah, I I guess that was sort of a question in my mind as well. Like, is there actual actually any chance for this sort of reservation? But I guess if you know government's been burnt in the past. And it's already sort of seems like it's set in stone. Maybe maybe there's slim to no chance of um, yep. getting something in place. Our, our, be our best chance is that uh, renewable energy continues to grow and and gas demand starts to tail <laughs> off, and then maybe maybe these will come down. But but yeah, there's there's and I think as well the other I mean the other thing is it's a it is a confusing issue, and it's not as simple as uh, well. I think it's as simple as these guys are basically overcharging, but they've turned it into a more complicated story and world markets and you know things like that and the they they can they turn it into a, a more complicated story that so that people don't really they like I don't know I don't really understand it seems complicated yeah. maybe maybe they're right mm. as opposed to you know no you shouldn't you should, the gas shouldn't be selling for the same price if it doesn't have to be picked up and frozen like picking it up and freezing it should roughly uh, yeah, we should and, and transporting it should roughly double the price from from local ones. So, yeah, whatever you sell, so if you're selling at six dollars here and another six dollars to freeze it, send it overseas to get it to twelve dollars in in Asia, that's that's about right. Whereas we're paying twelve dollars here and they're paying twelve dollars in in Asia. So, yeah, oh well, it doesn't quite add up. But um, what can we do? That's the yeah. that's, that's right. Well, and we're looking at uh, Santos and Woodside looking at a merger at the moment. So. Um, <laughs> yeah, more taking more of the uh, having having fewer uh, gas companies. So so you know, add add some more cartel members, or add, add another, or sorry, make one of the cartel members bigger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So so the question then is on this supply destruction because that's that's the other question we go now is is saying so so with oil prices low, there's a, there's a few different parts you can come out of this. One is the positive side, and you can say. Uh, effectively, the reverse of the argument we were talking about last time, which is when you spend twenty dollars less on your petrol each week, then that's more money you have in your pocket, and then you know maybe you go out and, and eat, or you go out for you stay out a bit longer. Maybe not, not to say the twenty dollars is going to buy you much, but you know there's a a you know maybe that's an extra drink or two that you, you're going to have at the pub, and and that money then sort of you know circulates around the the in, in the local economy much more. So money money that you're spending. Uh, more if you spend another twenty dollars that goes to an oil company in Saudi Arabia or, or or wherever, then that doesn't actually circulate in the Australian economy, and it sort of pulls money out of the Australian economy and, and sends it overseas. Whereas if you're um, if that money is now circulating in the Australian economy, you know I, I buy a few extra drinks at the pub, and then that person the pub gets a little bit more money, and then they spend it more on staff, and those staff members then you know go and do other things with theirs, and 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 that money sort of keeps you get this multiplier effect. And so we spoke before about this idea that above a hundred dollar oil, you got this um, demand destruction uh, in terms of people were spending money, and uh, sorry. It, yeah, that, that spending would, would kick in and, and that yeah, above $100, it tended to, be, to mean lower inflation. As you look at the this, now we're back into this sort of, you know, 80, 60 to $80, it, the, the relationship becomes pretty linear in terms of we look at uh, that, that means that lower inflation expectations start to get built in. And for the oil guys, it's, it's a question about when do they start switching off the taps and going, okay, well, if I was happy to sell oil at, at $90, but at $60 or something like that, I, I simply can't afford it. Now, the problem with oil is it's 
the cost curves for oil are, are very movable. So I've got a, a chart up just sort of showing this new new oil that can come on and, and how much it costs. And so if we look at, say, Saudi Arabia, uh, their break-even cost is about $20 uh, and could be as high as 30 could be as low as 10 depending upon which fields. And then you go through each, each of these factors. The U.S. shale sort of goes from somewhere between 40 and $80, and, and there's quite a lot of it. In, in terms of that's you know a, a really big one, and right at the top end is the Canadian heavy oil, which some of it you know you need a hundred dollars a barrel to, to to break even. Other ones you can do for sort of forty dollars a barrel. Now, the issue with this curve is it's it's not as fixed as you think. A lot of the costs that are coming out of this are are actually taxes. and the tax is based on the price. And so what happens is when the price halves, well, the taxes halve. And so there's there's a lot more malleability, malleability to this curve than you might think. And what it means as well is uh, for anyone who's already built something, if you've built something, your your marginal costs are nowhere near these costs. So you might have, you know, this might be saying your your break even cost is sixty dollars, and and it might might well have been on, on. But once you've actually built the 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 pipelines and and drilled the oil and and you've got it pumping through, your marginal costs are probably more like sort of $15 or, or, or lower. And so when do you actually stop pumping? Well, you need that oil to fall a long way before you actually stop pumping something you've already started up. So that's one part. Uh, the second part is that US shale has completely different dynamics to the rest of the, the these, these markets. Most of these other markets are, are talking about you know, if you're going to if you're going to do the the investment, you probably need to look at running it for twenty years or more to actually get to get a get a payback. And given the outlook and and rise in electric vehicles and things like that, uh, there's there's fewer and fewer companies willing to take those long term bets. But luckily, US shale only runs for two or three years, or you get most of the oil back in two or three years. So they've got a much shorter time frame, and they are a bit more reactive to to prices. We haven't really seen them starting to scale back yet. And, and production has still been growing in the US. Maybe these falls, recent falls we've seen might see a little bit of scaling back. But uh, the other side of it is in the US, what we've really seen over the last 10 years, what's different to, to, to where we were 10 years ago versus today is that a lot of the US shale 10 years ago was owned by just small players, whereas a lot of it now is owned by the, the, the oil majors. And, and what that means is that you might have had an oil shale producer, for example, who they had a break even of, of $70 and the price was 100 or, or might have been, yeah, whatever, whatever the price was. They were just going to pump. That was their only, that was their only acreage. So that's what they were going to, that's what they're going to use, regardless of what the price was. You know, if it fell below 70, they might stop, but, but largely they were going to produce. Whereas because the oil majors own a whole raft of different places they'll have some expensive ones some cheaper ones and some really cheap ones they're out there actually saying well we're not going to drill the, the 70 dollar oil one yet because we've got a whole bunch of ones we could drill at the 40 and 50 dollars and then so they'll keep chipping away at those ones and then eventually they'll get to they'll, they'll do all the best ones first and then they'll gradually work their way up to 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 the to the more expensive ones and so i do think we're going to see less demand destruction or less, sorry less supply destruction from these lower prices in u.s shale because now they're owned by much bigger companies and they can, uh, the bigger companies can actually factor in the, the prices and they're, gonna, they're just going to leave the, the, the poorer ones until prices are, are, are higher or they can lock in those you know, prices high enough that it actually justifies it. And just to illustrate what I was saying about that moving supply, I've got a chart up from, uh, oh, I've forgotten, it might be Wood McKenzie, maybe one of the, Oh no! Actually, maybe this is a Goldman Sachs one. Sorry, I should have I should have forgotten to source this one. But it's just showing the uh, that same oil curve over time, and so you can see that in two thousand and nine we had this oil curve, which was like you know we can only produce ten thousand extra 10, 10 million extra barrels per day uh, from from new sources. Otherwise, we're going to be paying like one hundred and twenty dollars. But by two thousand and seventeen, there was four times as much you could produce before it went before that line went vertical. And so, uh, yeah, and I guess that the part of the point of that is the, a big input into this is what actually is the current price because that affects the um, uh, that that affects the the taxes. 
And then the second part is there's there's lots of other factors and and supply and, and other things coming on uh, and efficiencies that that sort of send this line all over the place as, as time goes. So so uh, I guess the, the net effect of that is look at, at low enough levels you see oil price destruction and, and the biggest positive I think you can see say for oil prices at the moment is that because of all the uncertainty and all the ESG, there's a reasonable chance that we're not going to have um, enough. There's going to be some some gaps in supply at certain times over the next sort of 10, 20 years as, as we go through this transition. But knowing when that is and and being able to uh, take advantage of that, I think is is going to be difficult. For me, it's about saying, well, oil prices are closing in on on hundred dollars or two hundred dollars. Oh, sorry, hundred dollars plus. Then. I'm absolutely thinking about jumping out of those stocks and, and and looking elsewhere. When oil prices get down to maybe fifty dollars or below, now I'm starting to think, okay, are there some short term um, possibilities within that? And then uh, somewhere in between, I'm, I'm a little bit more agnostic about about what I want to have. But I, I do know that we're in this period now where we spoke before about being surprised that the oil price hadn't driven risen further and maybe that was a sign of of a weaker economy than what we thought and that is seem seeming to uh to uh to reflect now in the uh in the current stats that we're seeing excellent so uh, now we've got our question of the week so this is for viewers to have some discussion in the comment section over the coming days and the question this week is, it's a bit of a longer one. Two months ago, investors were worried about high oil prices and inflation. Now it's low oil prices and deflation. Has the pendulum swung too far? So feel free to post your thoughts and engage with us and some of the other viewers over the coming days. And Damo, back to you for investment implications. Yeah. So I guess my thoughts on this is, no, I don't think the pendulum has swung too far. I think we're into a phase now where we're going to see some reasonable easing of inflation on the back of oil prices. Now, this is not going to affect, this is going to affect headline inflation, not core inflation. We spoke last time about how central banks strip out oil prices when they look at, and, and energy costs when they look at inflation, because what they really want to see is they want to see these underlying core bits of inflation. What, what are they doing? Now, within the US, what we're seeing very much is uh, services inflation is still running pretty hot. One of the biggest parts of that is the housing inflation, which is has turned uh, has turned down, and we're going to start seeing some negative prints coming out over the over the you know, the next few months. It just takes a little while to, to filter through, but 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 it's still running relatively hot. Food inflation look it's above average, but it's not it's no longer concerningly above, and, and um, uh, yeah, so that's that's the food part, and and oh, sorry, and then the, the the net effect on fertilizers costs and all these other factors should should actually start to flow through and in, in, into uh, into the food inflation and low oil prices. Uh, energy inflation is negative, and it looks like it's going to be negative for a little while. And we've got goods deflation, so so the goods prices that really drove that inflation at the start of the cycle is now turned quite firmly negative. The net effect of all this is we've still got inflation that's that's above target, but it's it's uh it's primarily services driven because now we're looking at at lower energy prices and and that uh that that headline inflation being lower that sort of turns this this issue into saying okay is that going to help uh soften the blow for the rest of the economy because there'll be more money around for for, people, for consumers and consumers might actually spend a little bit more than what they might have done with high oil prices and so that's that's certainly um factoring into it but it's also factoring in that in the inflation impulses we've seen uh, look like they're going to be going away. So unless you see a, some sort of uh, rapid escalation or, or problems, rapid escalation in, in tensions in, in the Middle East or or other problems sort of start to flow up, it does look like that inflation issues we, we spoke about have, have pretty firmly uh, disappeared. And uh, certainly in the last couple of days, uh, even more so. So we sort of set this topic up at the start of the week and with with much higher bond yields and and every day that sort of seems to come out and, and we saw a, a relatively dovish fed uh is that we're seeing more and more signs that those those in uh that inflation impulses are have have well and truly peaked and and, and quite possibly uh we're looking at sort of the end of rate rises in in the us more problems in australia because of of the amount of crush loading the amount of new people um we've got coming in and, and the lack of um we're not going to see the same effects of, on 
on inflation is what we spoke about. So, uh, and given the Aussie dollar has had a, a, a monster rally as part of this, uh, our, our thoughts are now that you, you need to be looking more uh, internationally. So, uh, and it, that the, the, the concept that, that Australia will see through and, and not have the, the same sort of deflationary impacts we think is wrong. We think that will come it, it might just be a bit more delayed. And so uh, there, there will be a, you know, we're looking for, for, for further exposure to, to different themes and, and, and different stocks where we think you'll, uh, you'll, you'll get benefits from this. And for us, the, the Aussie dollar is now, it was, a, was a headwind for you over the last month or two, but the, the rise has been so, so rapid and, and uh, so quick that now it's time to actually start loading into some more international equity, if you feel. Awesome. Thanks for that demo. Uh, we have had a comment through from Jeff Robinson. Uh, just like to get your take and see if you've got any thoughts on it. Uh, he's saying US shale is rolling over. It's too efficient. It's too quick. And uh, the Permian Basin is the only area holding up for now. Uh, have you got any, any thoughts on that? Uh, is that uh, I think I'll just come back to that thought that keep in mind the US. So, so, so you're absolutely right in that US shale production is uh and the 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 capex cycle is is much much faster than you see anywhere else in the world so and the reason why is because if i uh have an oil more, uh well say in you know uh africa somewhere or or, or offshore offshore africa somewhere is it i'm building that it's going to start so it's going to pump whatever a million barrels a day that that's going to be a million barrels a day and it's gradually going to fade off over 20 years to, to 500,000 barrels a day or something like that. If I look at a US shell one, it, it might start pumping a million barrels a day on, on, on day one. By two or three years later, it'll be down to uh, you know, 100,000 or, or 200,000 barrels. It's, it's just such a, it's a, it's such a huge fall off that, that you get in terms of the amount of oil. Now, that so, sounds really bad in that, oh, I'm not for one of these wells that just lasts, for, lasts forever. That's, that's great. And, and but but the issue is for um, for the rest of the world for planning purposes for, for for I guess society as planning purposes you can make a decision on a two year well really quickly you can say yep I can lock in those prices I can get I can build this well I can get eighty percent of what I'm going to get out in the first two years I can see that's going to meet my cash flows and I can even hedge that far and now I'm, I'm you know I can make a quite much faster decision. Whereas uh, that 20 year, you can't hedge that 20 year and you've got to spend that and just hope that oil prices are going to be high enough. And so, uh, so yeah, so the decisions to come both on and off for US shale is, is, is much faster, which does mean they're going to, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll pull back much faster. And you, but the issue as well is on, on that, given we've now got the, the much bigger companies, they can actually just go out and drill all the best ones. And I, I think that's where I think the the fall off won't be as fast as what we've seen in, in prior cycles, uh, but the that you know they will lift faster when when it comes on. I think does that answer the question, Tatum, or do you think of? I think so. The, that's yeah. some good insights. So mm -hmm. hopefully, um, yeah, Jeff resonates with those. And um, yeah, if anyone else has got any any questions, um, feel free to ask them. Um, and yeah, one other thing I want to add, as always, in this section, uh, as the viewers would have heard, we do have around 100 different screens and tilts. With the screens, uh, you can screen out all fossil fuels, so any any uh, stocks that engage in fossil fuels, uh, and also the worst offenders. And then there's also, you can screen out any uh, GICS sector materials. Then on the other side of the of the coin, with the tilts, uh, we can add in extra stocks. We've got a specific oil and gas stocks uh, tilt there. So if the oil price is, you know, getting down to those lower bands, like Damo mentioned, you know, it could be worth putting some extra exposure in there. Or you, with the tilts, you can do them as standalone portfolios as well. Um, so that almost wraps us up. And I mean, we will continue to tell the story as it unfolds. So thanks for listening. Um, and yeah, we'll see you all next time. Um, so just final thoughts. Uh, we do welcome your feedback on this podcast, especially in regards to suggestions for future topics. If you do have any ideas, please drop it in the comment section below or send us an email to contact at newkillswealth.com. Also, if you know of anyone that might get some value out of today's episode, we'd really appreciate it if you do share it with them also. 
So for myself, Damien, and the rest of the team at Nuclear Swealth, thanks for watching, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye for now.